You're listening to the world's smartest podcast network. Hey everyone, welcome to a bonus episode of Majoring in Everything. As you know, normally on this show, I interview someone who I consider to be majoring in everything. This time, I am releasing this episode uh, because I thought it was a cool conversation with thoughtful, smart people, and my listeners are thoughtful, smart people, and so I thought you might enjoy it. I did this as a guest uh, on a crossover podcast between the neoliberal podcast and the political orphanage. You may know the, the political orphanage from our previous guest on May during and everything, Andrew Heaton. He's the host. And the three of us got together to talk about identity politics, and that's nice and fun and light. And it was a lovely conversation and they're releasing it on their podcast. And I figured, heck, heck, that's what I figured. Why not release it on my own? So this is a bonus episode. Uh, I hesitated because, I mean, this is not interesting, but I hesitated because I was like, well, this isn't the format. People are going to get mad. And then I remembered that my show is about everything. And last I checked, identity politics is under the category of everything. So I think I'm just going to start posting any old thing that I want. Uh, anyway, this is it. Listen to it if you want to or not. Uh, be sure to check out the other podcasts if you enjoyed this conversation. And I don't know, even if you don't, they're probably, well, I was going to say they're probably better than this conversation, but it's a pretty great conversation. So uh, enjoy. Andrew, I don't know if I told you this, but I, in two weeks, I'm going to be eating bugs for, live on stream. For Australia. pleasure? Is this like you're, this, this, is, this <laughs> is just the new, like the, the, the neoliberal podcast isn't working out that well, so you're, you're doing this other thing? <laughs> <laughs> Business or pleasure, ma'am. Um, yeah. No, so the story goes that our community, the neoliberals, were raising money for charity. They're raising money uh, for malaria bed nets okay. in Africa. It's a great cause. Very nice. And like the genius that I am, I said, hey, if uh, you guys raise $100,000, I'll eat bugs. You know, like they'll never raise uh -huh. that much. Yeah. Well, Apparently, some some guy stepped in and donated like twenty eight thousand wow. dollars to hit the thing. Some some and they had already gotten pretty high, uh -huh. otherwise. But some guy made the well, gap happen. So was that guy your sworn enemy? <laughs> Apparently He's, now. Yeah. So yeah. I, I went to I, what I've discovered through this process is number one, uh -huh. this is happening. Number two, there are websites where you can just buy like cool ranch okay. crickets. You know what? Like, okay, so so like, like Ed, every Pringles flavor comes I, in grasshopper. I have a apparently. lot. Before we even get to proper introductions, I have a lot. Wait, actually, hold on. Let's do proper yeah. introductions real quick, and, and then we can go back to <laughs> we can go back to bugs, and then I promise we'll get to identity politics for people that are confused right now. So, uh, first of all, the, the man who's talking that is Jeremiah Johnson of the Neoliberal Podcast. Hello, Jeremiah. Well, thank you for and, having me. And uh, we are joined by Dr. Andrea Jones Roy, who is uh, one of the wonderful people on the World's Smartest Podcast Network and the host of Majoring in Everything. Hello, Andrea. Hello. Uh, you had me at Cool Ranch uh -huh. Crickets. So I'm here. Well, you can sneak in the identity <laughs> politics later, but I'm happy to go Cool Ranch and, for the full uh, hour, Good. Excellent. So. And I, I am Andrew Heaton, the host of The Political Orphanage. And I have eaten a surprising amount of bugs, uh, Jeremiah. Yeah, because oh, cool, yeah? I went to, uh, I went to uh, um, East Asia. I was doing stand-up comedy in East Asia about three or four years ago uh, and was was doing Turner's mm -hmm. Festival in, in, uh, in China. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I hopped around. I did some stand-up in Cambodia. I know all of the comedians in Cambodia, all two of them. I'm friends with 100% of the right. comedians <laughs> in Cambodia. And just uh, bugs are a part of the cuisine there. And when I uh, – my tuk-tuk my driver, when we'd kind of run out of sites to see, would be like, I don't know, you want to go eat bugs? And I'd be like, sure, man. <laughs> so so I've, I actually have strong thoughts on this. Like I don't care for beetles so much. I do like larvae. Uh, and I like, like, um, I'll, I'll have to go through, I've got it written down. Cause I was like, if I ever have a chance to eat that again. So anyway, point is, uh, can I get in on this with you, Jeremiah and try and get the political orphans to raise <laughs> money for mosquito nets to end malaria? Cause I I'll eat bugs. If we can, I'm going to say this, if, uh, if, if we can, if we can get, if we can get $300, I'll eat bugs with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to hit that. So I will give you $300. <laughs> there we go. So the story okay. has a second chapter, by the way. Okay. Um, this is going to be very romantic in a second. So this is being done, I think, in okay. two weeks' time from when we're recording this. It's going to be done on, live on our live stream, on our Twitch, on uh, February 14th, which is basically Valentine's I mean, Day. I, right? think I think it straight up is um, Valentine's, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. I don't even think there's a yeah, yeah, so yeah. I should know this. I'm married. That. I should yeah. know this. Um, so on Valentine's Day, I'm, I'm doing this. And I mentioned, you know, in a previous stream, okay, this is happening you know, and ha ha ha. Isn't it funny that, um, that old conservative meme about there's like this, 
you know, the liberals, they want you to live in a pod and eat soy and bugs. And, <laughs> and, you know, like that's the liberal vision of the future. And I mentioned like, it's actually pretty funny we're doing this because I live half a block from something called the Pod Hotel uh, here in New York. Nice. And so somebody then donated $100 to the live stream and said, this is for you to get a hotel room at the Pod Hotel so you can literally be in the pod and eat bugs and like fulfill I, that I vision of, of the future. nothing more romantic than That's you awesome. and your wife eating fried crickets Lady in the Tramp style on Valentine's Day. Andrew, I'm... I'm in the pod I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to an illicit hotel uh, to eat I'm, bugs. I'm down for this show <laughs> on Valentine's to, to, Day, and that sounds like some weird. I mean, sex I'm, thing, no, I'm, I'm, for, <laughs> I no. I mean that is for, literally. First of all, possible. Jeremiah, I'm at a point. In my I'm up for anything. Let's let's like I'm I'm willing to try some stuff. I I will be in New York though because I'm I've I've decided I don't think I'm going to line up a date in Austin between now and Valentine's Day. So rather than being sad by myself, I'm just going to fly to New York, see my friends, go to Marie's Crisis, which is my favorite bar where I get to sing show tunes. So as long as I can sing show tunes after or before I eat bugs with you, I will go to your illicit hotel room. It's a plan. I think the it's whole night needs to Great. be live streamed. Excellent. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, uh, we, yeah. we'll talk. We'll talk. However... Uh, we, we, we were going to talk about identity politics. Uh, and, and so I feel like w while, while, uh, we'll work out the kinks on all this and I'll get the political orphans to, maybe I should up the ante beyond 300 to like 380 or something. That, that said, we were going to talk about political, uh, uh, uh about, uh, 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 identity politics. So uh, for the, for the yeah. kickoff for that, I feel like a good hook is President Biden and um, and uh, his forthcoming Supreme Court nomination. So Andrea, can you walk us through why that's in the news? Oh, I sure can. I was hoping for some more cool ranch questions, but that's fine. I, uh, I can do this too. So President Biden has said that to replace the retiring Supreme Court justice, he will make sure that he appoints a black woman to the Supreme Court. And that, not surprisingly, has caused a lot of people to get very wound up in a lot of directions. I, I think summary? so. I think you nailed it. Yeah. Uh, There's a, some technical language in there, no, so you uh, tell me so, if so, I need uh, so. uh, Supreme Court Justice Breyer is stepping down. Um, he's, he's doing so mm -hmm. as uh, predicted for a normal Supreme Court justice while there is a president of his party um, who's, who's able to fill that gap. Uh, and so... Unlike that RBG... RBG and Scalia went, no, we're going to run out the clock... <laughs> We are, you are going to pry the gavel yeah. from my cold, dead hands. And both of them made that work. But Breyer's going, no, I'd rather, I'd rather a Democrat appoint me, uh, appoint my successor. And uh, yes, Bi Biden came out and said, I, he is specific, like he is specifically looking to fill not just the judicial role, but also to have a identity politics. He wouldn't say it this way, but to have an element of identity politics in it. Um, and, and that is causing consternation. Um, I, I think I'd put myself in that category, to be honest with you. I, I kind of, um, when, when we, mm. when we get into this kind of thing, I, I'm at the point where, uh, I am fine with, um, uh, diversity being a tiebreaker. So that is to say that if there are three or four different qualified jurists that the president's looking at and he goes, okay, well, three of these are, are white male Catholics, which is all of the men on the court at this time. It would be good to have somebody else's, else's opinion. If they're all equal, I'm going to pick this other one to get an outside. That okay, I like that. I don't like the idea right. of of that being the preeminent criteria by which to select the jurists. And I, I also worry that whoever's right. going to be in there now is going to be presumed as a diversity hire for the rest of their career, even if they don't deserve it, which is very likely because it'll be picked from the right. federal bench. Right. I think that's the main risk and. Maybe it's not that interesting if I just come out. I'm like, a Heaton's right. I agree yeah. with you completely. <laughs> this is the first time on our podcast, right? Because it does do a disservice to whoever he appoints. And, I mean, Biden did something like this with the vice president as well. He said that he would appoint a woman or he would, you know, hire. What is the verb? Knight. Ask. Uh, de deputize. Knight. Lieutenantize. Oh, oh. Deputize. Deputize a vice presidential candidate who is a woman. And I think that... In this case, it's even more specific, and it's a lifelong appointment, and it's such a fraught process. You can kind of make a VP whoever you want. You have to go through any Senate. I mean, there's an you election. You name out of a hat like George Bush did. It's almost like he kind of played yes and with himself and uh, <laughs> because it, it worked the first time, and I think it's a huge mistake. Hmm. Well, so I, I agree with you guys in terms of it being a political mistake. I, I don't necessarily think it's actually a problem, like a real problem in, in a policy sense or that anything wrong, has been done wrong here. 
But I do think it's kind of a political own goal. You know, what my liberal progressive friends tell me is, you know, well, look, Robert, or not Robert, Robert Reagan. <laughs> Robert um, the Reagan, the great president. actor. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Robert. R- Ronald Reagan Trickle explicitly promised, <laughs> but he, he explicitly said when there was an opening, I'm going to nominate uh, a woman. Uh, and sweet. Donald Trump, to replace RBG, explicitly said, I'm going to nominate uh-huh. a woman. And of course, people didn't get mad at that because there's a there's a weird intersection of progressives can't get mad for the reason that it's a, a identity politics woman candidate. They can get mad for a lot of other reasons that they think Amy Coney Barrett is is Hitler in her views. In fact, they did um, get mad, but <laughs> they were real worked up about that. Yes, they got I they got very mad. Recall. Yeah, but it wasn't for the reason of that. And so, th- the to the progressives, it seems very you know, opportunistic, this anger about, you know, an identity promise being made. And, you know, I I think they do have a point in that the, the standard is only going one way and that, you know, it there's one crowd who will get mad at this only under the circumstances that it, well, we just want to be mad at the other guy. We're going to take that excuse that we now have to be mad at the other guy. But with that said, you know, I, I do think that, um, it's just an own goal. You know, there, there was some polling that came out. I think 76% of Americans didn't want uh, to, you know, th- this kind of thing to happen for Biden to come out and say that it's going to be a black woman. And and one of the best takes that I've seen is that, frankly, Biden should have been prepared for this. Biden should have known that there's a really high chance Stephen Breyer was going to retire. He should already know who he's going to pick. And rather than say, I'm going to pick a black woman, he should just say, I'm going to pick, uh, what's her, I think one of the prominent ones is like uh, Kentaji Brown Jackson or something like that. He should say, I'm going to pick Miss Jackson. She's an incredibly qualified judge and she's, you know, nobody can doubt her credentials. Here's all her Ivy right. League and credentials. Just say right. her name rather than saying, yeah, I'm going to pick a black a, woman. Just go ahead and say the have black a, woman. Have you know. a little bit of a, a magician's hand faint of, oh, Breyer is going to step down. Well, we're going to assemble a crack shot list of 10 justices. Don't know who it's going to be yet. They're all going to be really, really good. Happens to be this lady. Um, we, we picked her yep. based on qualifications and qualifications alone. However, she's also also these things. I, I think that would have been more politic. There's, there's political jujitsu here where because of what he did, because of the way he said it, now it's very, very easy to criticize. And, and people who don't pay attention to the news will kind of get upset about it. And this is small potatoes in the end. Like this is not going to decide the 2022 midterms. It's not going to decide the 2024, but it is a little bit of an own goal. Mm -hmm. The jujitsu is that if you just say her name, if you say I'm nominating Kentaji Brown Jackson, then criticism becomes directly at her. And that's way harder to directly criticize her particular record because it makes you look like more of an asshole to like go after her. Another thing that it does, and let me say, uh, amend something I said earlier where I said, I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake to say it the way he said it. I think appointing a black woman to the Supreme Court is a great move. And I agree with both of you that if he had just come out and said, here's a great candidate, let's go, that would have been a totally different scenario. But I think another risk is that it pits, and black women listening to this, please tell me if I'm wrong, it, it pits black women against each other. The same way when he said, okay, I'm going to nominate a woman as a vice president, all of a sudden we're thinking of this pool as as citizens, we're thinking of this pool of like five possible women it could be, and it becomes this weird competition between the leading political women in the country. And I worry that he's going to do the exact same thing, and I'm speaking really out of turn because I cannot obviously speak from the perspective of a black woman, but as a non-man in comedy, it's the same sort of feeling where you kind of feel like you're all competing for the one spot that's not the man on the show. And Biden is almost just reinforcing that and saying like, hey, are you the black woman at this prestigious law firm? Well, you're going to be up against only other black women for this leading thing. And, and I don't know if that's a part of the conversation, but I feel like I could see why it might be. And that seems bad. To- I, I also, I get part of the reason that I'm off put by a lot of um, diversity forward hiring initiatives within government specifically uh, is a lot of the time, I think they are somewhat disingenuous. And what I mean by that is, I think if we're really interested in the concept of diversity, it would also be incumbent upon us to be interested in different perspectives, different upbringings, and different um, different ideologies. And I, my right. anecdotal experience is 
You're saying that the court, which is a hundred percent Jewish yeah. and Catholic and a hundred percent Ivy League, I, I think I think every single one of them has gone to yes, Harvard I, or Yale. I think that that's I'm all sure. right. Yeah, and and you know what, I, I, and you, I, it might actually not be correct anymore. It might be eight out of nine now. But there was there was a point where every single justice was either Catholic or Jewish, and every single one I, was either. I believe Harvard that or Yale. is still the case because a uh, 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 Barrett is is also Catholic. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's an example. I mean, I, I, I'll say it's a little bit different with the judiciary specifically because the judiciary is not and should not be making policy. It's not, it's not the job of the judiciary to attempt to sculpt American society based on their life experiences. It is 100% their job to interpret the law as it is. And I, I think that for, for yes, is that is straight up. <laughs> I mean, that's, that I, I would challenge that. Also, I want to. I realize that saying the whole Catholic and Jewish thing makes me sound like an 1800s style <laughs> racist. Right? I should point out that I come from an extremely Irish Catholic uh, family. Yeah. Um, but like, I'm not. I'm not doing the no Irish right. need I, apply I, thing. I, I think it was. But clear I, that you were, I, I, I just yeah. want to challenge you. Real, no, challenge, challenge away. <laughs> I, I want to challenge real quick though, because there is a view of the federal judiciary that is well, we, we're umpires. We're just calling right. balls and strikes, you know, and it's a very non-passionate. Yeah. Like um, and well, this is, that's a political stance though. That is a story the judiciary loves to tell uh -huh. about itself. Um, but in a lot of senses, you know, when, when you have a court that is trying to interpret the constitutional nature of how speech is regulated on the internet, and you have like people seriously writing sentences about how the founders would have interpreted text messaging, yeah. like that's that's nonsense. You're you're coming up with your own principles for what the law should be. You're not really at, at that point. You're so removed from constitutional questions as James Madison would have understood them. You know what what would James Madison have thought about OnlyFans? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's stuff that comes up. And, I would listen to that podcast episode by the way. And and there's to, to me there's no. There's no concept of calling balls and strikes anymore. And you, you see this more and more that there is a defined conservative camp and a defined liberal camp. And they're not exactly consistent in sometimes they're consistent and they're, they're not 100 percent like like people like to point out, oh, sometimes Scalia, you know, sided with the progressives on something. But for the most part, they had their you so, know, quirks, and, and we know what they are, and they're I, political I, uh, quirks. I hard disagree on all of these matters, and I'm going to push back. <laughs> hey, everyone. AJR here interrupting my own podcast, good for me, to share some exciting news. As you may know, I'm a data science professor, among some other things, which is part of why I do this show. And I teach college students and corporate clients how to do data science. And one thing that's made me really mad over the years is that whenever I tell other people that I teach data science and they are not already involved in data science, they freak out and they say, oh, data science, I could never do data science, I can't possibly. And that's so sad to me because everyone can get involved in data science. It's super fun, it's interesting, and we need your wisdom in data science, I promise. So I am putting on a show called The Data Science Spectacular. It's on Tuesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. It's at Caveat Theater in New York City. You can go to www.caveat.com dot nyc for tickets or you can go to my instagram or twitter at jonesroy j-o-n-e-s-r-o-o-y for links to get tickets and it is in person and it's live stream so you can watch in any form that you want and i think the live stream tickets give you access to the show for a few days so even if you can't make that time check it out and come join me in the wild world of data science oh there's gonna be comedy and circus as well see you there you think James Madison had a had a strict OnlyFans I, policy? He did. He did. I, I've <laughs> I've seen the James first. Madison daguerreotype <laughs> pornography, uh, and it was very tasteful <laughs> and mind expanding. Um, well, so yeah. So uh, the, the the main thing that I want to push back on is I think what what you're basically saying is that the judiciary is just about naked power and partisan power, and everything else is a lie and a mantle um, that disguises that. And if that's the case. Why bother having it? I mean, that to me is a terrifying prospect. That, would, that That's basically saying that the judiciary itself is just unelected senators whose job is to push partisan agendas. I, I don't think that. I don't go that far. I mean, I, I think I think it's a, it's a mixture of the two because it is about – there are some people who will say it's just about naked power. I'm not espousing that point of view. But you can think about it like, you know, bureaucratic administrators of the state, federal bureaucrats – who are running these giant departments, Department of Energy, Department of Hous Housing and you know Health and Human Services and all of this stuff. And their job supposedly is to dispassionately interpret the laws that Congress has passed. 
but Congress cannot pass laws so detailed that they cover every single instance of how every single thing should be run in the trillions of dollars that we spend in the federal government. So in reality, it, there are ideological decisions to be made within these departments. That's why it matters who actually is running the Department of Energy and the Department of Education and all these things. And so on the one hand, they do have to follow the law. Congress has set guidelines for them and they have to follow the law. On the other hand, they have ideological stances they can take. And the judiciary is kind of like that. They, To some degree, they're calling balls and strikes and they are interpreting the law. And that's why you do see a lot of 9-0 decisions in the Supreme Court. But there's also stances of, you know, just that are pretty much partisan. Whether or not you know, a fetus is a human life in the abortion question is not something that you can find in in the Constitution or, you know, in in real legal principles, unless Congress just passes a law that says it is. It's kind of just we're all going to interpret it the way that, you know, maximizes our politics well, for exists. certain questions. It ex I mean, courts in general, not just the Supreme Court, exist because exactly as you said, Jeremiah, the and I, I even talked to some lawyer who said it this way once for an article I was writing where it's like <clears throat> the law can't possibly cover every single behavior. So it necessarily exists for times when we're in the gray zone where it's like, is this legal? Is this not? Obviously, there's also evidence in like criminal courts and whatever. Right. But it's not that they can just then only have a partisan agenda. I think that I'm going to give lawyers a little more credit than I normally do, which is to say that they do have to tether their arguments to reason and legal precedent and other things. And so generally, yes, in these split court decisions, we do see that people pretty much fall the party partisan line with some exceptions that we get all wound up about. But it's not like they're just saying, eh, because, right? There is a burden of logic that they must prove and work through. And that burden has caused, has had consequences. Like I'm going to mess up the details, but with the Affordable Care Act and like constitutional rights, didn't like the conservative side get very wound, like stuck in its own argument where they said that it was constitutional or it wasn't like, it's not like they can just say whatever they want. Like it's somewhere between balls and strikes and just pure partisan, whatever. And I say that as someone who's very skeptical of anyone. Um, in the legal I, I, Cause it seems horrible. It seems like a horrible field uh, to be in. <laughs> I, I no, I, I love the legal field. I think, I, I think I probably should have been, I should uh, have been an attorney. Did. I'd be uh, worse. Maybe. I'd have the same wardrobe, but I'd be more <laughs> successful. Uh, but but I'll add to that that like I, yeah. I I find that uh, I've spoken to several judges. I've read a bunch of judges, and all, all of them that that are at that level uh, agree that it is not their job, and I think mean it that it's not their job to create policy. RBG would say that. Uh, Scalia would say that. Mm. The breakdown tends to be in constitutional interpretation. Falling broadly along, are we trying to do a faithful textual analysis, or do we acknowledge that some of the words in the text are variable, and those variables have to be interpreted based on where we are today? That's the fundamental breakdown between originalist and living constitutionalist logic. Um, when they're just doing, like, I really wish this had been a policy and Congress didn't get around to it, so I'm going to try and shoehorn it into my judicial decision, that's straight-up judicial activism, which is generally abhorrent to both camps, at least rhetorically. Uh, so, but, but all of this being said, though, um, I, I will digress from this slightly, Jeremiah, and, and your wanton slander of the American judiciary uh, by, by noting that all the same, <laughs> that, that their acknowledged role, and I think what they think they're doing, is to interpret the law. It, it's, their, their goal is, their stated goal is not to make it. It's because they have, because they have dispassionate jurist as an identity. Mm. It, you know, they've been a lawyer for so long that it literally has become their identity. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm bringing us no, back no, no, around to identity. No, I, 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 so I, I, I think there's an, there actually is an element of that, that they, there's a story that they yeah. tell themselves right. and that they want Could to be. fulfill. There's... And I will say no one makes me more nervous than people who think they are dispassionate and objective because none of us are. That's a huge joke. And if we think that we are, whether we're journalists, politicians, Supreme Court justice, then we really get into trouble. Um, the, I, I interviewed a guy named Yuval Levine uh, about a year and a half ago now who uh, wrote a book called A Time to Build. And one of the presumptions in it is that part of the problem we're having right now is that institutions have basically turned into platforms. That it used to be that you went, in, mm. you went into an institution with the idea that to some extent the institution was going to mold you and professionally sculpt what you were going to do 
based off of the criteria and norms of that particular profession, i.e. journalism, Congress, whatever, and that we've moved away from that to where people kind of become their own thing. And uh, um, I, I think that that could well apply to what you're talking about, Jeremiah, with with uh, mm-hmm. identity polit- with the sense of identity being somewhat inbuilt by virtue of going through uh, a judicial process or something else. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, my theory of politics is that all all politics is identity politics, 100% of it. And this is maybe a slight exaggeration, but I, it, it might not be. It might be literally everything. And, you know, I, I think about the Federalist Society, if we're sticking with, you know, nominating someone to the Supreme Court, that that becomes a, an identity that mm-hmm. that people take on, that, you know, progressive is an identity, socialist is an identity. If you want to get into broader politics, you know, gun owner is an is absolutely yep. an identity um, in the United States. Um, and so w- when people say identity politics, they usually mean it in this uh, current Joe Biden sense that, you know, black people care about race issues or women care about, you know, women's rights or women's health access issues. But I, I think it goes into everything that gun owner politics are identity politics, that people definitely identify as that. You know, you look at what Donald Trump did in rural white America and you tell me that's not identity politics, and I'm just going to laugh. I'm going right. to laugh and laugh, because w- what else or, could it or, be? Or like a lot of the time, I think when we're talking about identity politics, we are we're typically discussing racial, sex, or sexual orientation in terms of identity politics. But identity politics, as you point out, Jeremiah, could be vocational as well. Uh, I, I am a teacher. I am a union mm-hmm. guy. Um, I think that this is something that... Well, I, actually, this is a question I want to pitch to you then. Um, uh, I know Andrea is familiar with Eric Grossman. I've, I've interviewed Eric Grossman before. Uh, or is it Matt Grossman? Um, uh, anyway, Professor Grossman out of Michigan. Matt. Um, uh, his, his thesis... Mm, Columbia, I think. Um, it doesn't, doesn't this matter. is irrelevant. The, 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 <laughs> the, the theory that Grossman has that I think has a lot to it is that historically speaking, and Trump is a very big um, counterfactual to what I'm about to say, but historically speaking, the Republican Party has organized itself and expressed itself ideologically, whereas the Democratic Party has organized and expressed itself coalitionally. So Democrats, when they are looking at a situation and, and organizing, will go, okay, We've got our teachers union. We've got the, the the gay coalition. We've got these various component groups which form our coalition, and we are going to facilitate legislation on their behalf, and that is our alliance. Whereas the Republicans have traditionally viewed it in terms of abstract thinking and ideology. Hence, pre-Trump, the the primary for Republicans was about who is Reagan's ghost, who is the reincarnated Reagan, who's a real Republican versus a rhino, and that kind of thing. Now, now, do you, uh, Jeremiah, do you see ideology just as a different form of identity, or does that theory militate against your principle that all things are ultimately identity politics? No, I think it's still identity, and that ideologies become identities, especially in the modern age. Mm -hmm. You know, how far back this stretches is a question, but, you know, in academic departments, and and Andrea, I'll, I'll defer to you here, you're the only practicing academic, but in your field, there are people who have bitter disputes, and there will be the, I don't know, the uh, like in linguistics, which you're not a linguist, but in linguistics, there's uh, the prescriptivists and the descriptivists. And those academics absolutely identify as one mm-hmm. or the other. And, you know, in foreign policy takes, you'll have the realists versus the internationalists versus the social constructivists the liberalists versus the the. Yeah, the the Marxist, you know, and these camps have bitter disputes and they absolutely identify as one thing. And they they love the people in their in-group. They hate the people in their out-group. They all have sacred texts the same way that a religion would. Mm -hmm. Um, And you look at things like even labels like socialist. The the modern socialist is somebody on Twitter who has a rose emoji in their handle because it's a way to signal that I'm in the in-group and you're in the out-group. And there's literally a whole list there's a whole list of like political emoji ideologies that you can find in these conversations that the neoliberals all have globes. The, the hmm. tankies have hammer and sickle emojis. I've got a top the hat. The Demo- the DSA, the DSA kids have a rose emoji. Like you could, there's part. Yimby emojis. The Yimbies have an avocado, like literally things like I'm a Yimby is an identity to people now. Yeah. And I, I think it goes all the way down when you think about, uh, being a neocon in foreign policy is it can be an identity when you believe it. And, you know, like we're, we're all 
I guess my theory is that we're all a bunch of overlapping identities mm -hmm. that just inform who we are. If I pick out somebody like Andrea, you know, you're you're white, you're a woman, but you're also a comedian. You're also a professor. You're also a performer. And, you know, academics have as as the part of their identity. I am a college professor. I'm an academic. That's deep in your soul part of who you are <laughs> oh, you know when you're when you're a comedian <laughs> when you're a comedian Andrea, you're that's a comedian i just want to throw this are. out you're an eth you're an ethnic oh. comedian i'm sorry uh that is <laughs> deep part of my Wait, soul so, so, oh. my soul is turning in its grave uh at that but, so, hang but on. It, I, okay I, I, I view all of us as basically these okay. overlapping identities so 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 you're every everybody's ahead, Jeremiah, just to saying? make sure i understand everybody's kind of a venn diagram or a jackson pollock painting of overlapping ide identities in your worldview yeah, and, and a lot of politics is determined by which identities can be activated. You know, are you mm -hmm. activating the part, the, the identity that says, um, you know, I'm anti-abortion? Or are you activating the identity that says I'm a black voter and I don't trust this other party? Because there's a lot of black voters who are anti-abortion and it's a battle for which identity gets activated. Uh, Andrea, I think you should respond since we mentioned all of your ethnic groups a moment ago. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to weigh in before yes, I, I do? Yes, I think so. All right, great. <laughs> I'll weigh in first. So uh, I feel very torn about whether I even need to bring this up, but because you have listeners who've heard me spiel about my own identity, I do not identify as a woman. But that brings up something very interesting, uh, which is uh, there's no way for uh, you to know. No apologies, no by the way. Uh, no need to apologize. But I bring that up because one's identity on the inside and, and how other people see them is also a whole complicated thing and there are distinctions. But more than that, and I'm really, honestly, I'm such a coward about the whole thing that had I not been on Heaton's podcast, I wouldn't have even mentioned it, so great. Uh, but what's my point? My point is we think about identity in a lot of different ways in political science. And I was, in anticipation of this episode and this conversation, I was thinking about how we talk about it in political science because when we hear identity politics out there in the world, it is, and I think one or both of you touched on this already, it is usually meant as like a dismissive, you know, anti-woke conservatives being like, oh, these liberals, right, with their identity politics. I think as a shorthand of saying, you're not paying attention to what really matters. You're throwing out your race or your gender and making that the story, and, and it shouldn't be the main story, right? In political science, Jeremiah, you're absolutely right that, you know, identity I, the role of one's identity in politics is its own huge field. And that can absolutely be your political identity. I, do you identify as a Democrat or a Republican or conservative or a liberal or a whatever? And you're 100% correct that that can be a huge part of how you interact with the world. And tons of academics have made tons of careers just understanding one's political identity, never mind all the others, right? There's also other research out there, and there's a journal, I can't remember the exact name, I meant to look it up, about the politics of identity. So we have identity politics, political identity, politics of identity. And the politics of identity is a little bit, Jeremiah, of what you were saying as well, where it's like, which one are we activating? Which is to say, like, are we all talking about race? Are we all talking about gender? Are we all talking about whatever? And is that going to get people worked up? And of course, that's what Trump has done. That's what a lot of people have done, right? But there's also the politics of identity in the sense that the identity that everyone has influences how they interact in a political system. So if I am interacting with the world as a black person or as a disabled person or as a Catholic person, my experiences are very different and are therefore going to shape my political views as well. So there's this idea, not just that, poly that identities are out there waiting to be activated like lightning striking, it's also an acknowledgement that my identity as a Latino whatever, 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 is influencing my behavior. So a lot of people look at it from like a bottom-up perspective, I would so, say. And see, th this is, well. all of these are fascinating points, and I don't know that I directly disagree with any of you. I'm just sort of um, processing these terms differently and, and using a different set of terms. But I'll, I'll say that on the note of, you know, a Latino having a different uh, life experience and therefore a different worldview, the, 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 that... Um, that sticks out in my mind by why I sometimes think these discussions are disingenuous. And, and the reason I bring that up is mm. um, in a lot of academic settings and a lot of media settings, they'll say, you know, we, we need to have a diverse group of people. We need to have lots of identities. And, I, and then somebody... somebody Did, since, since we started on the Supreme Court, wasn't there a, a Sotomayor quote about, you know, 
as a wise Latina woman, um, I some, something, yeah. something, something that people jumped on her for that. Uh, quote. She she had sort of done a wink at the camera of b- before she was on the um, be- before she'd been nominated of what the court needs is a wise Latina. She's sort of uh, referring to herself, but but but, but let Lester lose track of my point. The the reason that I oftentimes find this disingenuous is someone's like, well, we really need to have like. Uh, a black man on the Fed. And I'm like, great, Thomas Sowell. Put Thomas Sowell on the Fed. That, and they're like, well, not Thomas yeah. Sowell. He doesn't believe the right stuff. And they're like, well, we need to bring a, like a transgender lady. And I'm like, how about Deidre McCloskey? She'd be great. And they're like, well, she, no, she doesn't count either. And it's like, oh, okay, well, you're not, you don't, like, a lot of the time that stuff is just sort of weaponizing ideology where it's like, well, we've got this one very specific ideology that we're, we're wanting to have. What we basically want to do is have different flavors of it. But we want everybody to agree to the same thing. And we kind of want to weaponize it too because we don't want anybody to be able to argue with us. And that, that's why I get kind of flustered on this, where I'm like, well, I, I think ideological uh, ideological diversity is a positive thing. And a lot of the folks that are very much in favor of diversity don't appear to want to have ideological diversity. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Heaton, I thought you were going to go a totally different direction with the Latino example, which is to say that the Latino experience in the United States is far from homogeneous. And so to even ask a question like, how are Latinos yeah. going to vote is a useless question. And we saw that in the last election where Miami went very differently from what we expected. Well, yeah, and, and, right? yeah, and, and even, even just from a racial perspective, there's e- extremely black Latinos and extremely white Latinos. Exactly. You know, well, and, yeah, I mean, yeah. To, 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 exactly. to finish my tirade, I, I also think that most of the gains yes. we've had over the last 300 years have been either seeing people as fully human as part of one race or alternately viewing people as an individual. But the, the sort of worldview that everybody is a component of a race, I, I find highly regressive. So when mm-hmm. we move in those directions of, well, you're emblematic of this tribe of people that you have no control over, that bothers yeah. me. Yeah. Well, and I talk about this with my data science students, so I'll crowbar this in here as well, which is to say that the fundamental, well, a fundamental tension in this whole thing is acknowledging both that Humans, let's stick with the United States for simplicity, right? It's a famously simple place, so that's good. Uh, hum- like, what you look like, how you present, and your life experiences and your family experiences and your ideologies, all of that affects your opportunities and your life. And all. And it's it, we shouldn't pretend that the whole, like, we, I joked before we started recording that I'm just going to say that I, I don't see color, right? Everyone's, how you, your skin tone, your size, your everything affects how you move through the world and the types of frictions that you run into. And so it's tricky to both acknowledge that without then reducing people. And this is where the data science comes in. I promise without reducing people to these categories that I also, I agree with you, Heaton are feel regressive to say, well, let's count up the black people. Let's count up the, the Latino people. Let's mix all the Asians together. You know, this is even a horrible thing to say, but that's what we do in this census. That's where all our data about diversity in the workplace comes from is we literally went around and said, let's count the black people. Right. And you might say you're doing it to be, thoughtful about the fact that different people and different backgrounds in the United States have very, very different life experiences, but it almost reinforces, it almost reinforces it rather than ameliorates it. Well, can I ask a question there? Yeah. So the French take a very different approach to this um, because you mentioned the the, the, the United States, we literally have a census. We ask people about their race and about whether they're Latino or not, which is a Weird, separate, semi-racial question um, that is like separate from the other. Yeah, it's, it's always racial phrased, are, categories. Are you, it's uh, white, ethnicity. non-Latino, and I'm like, what? I, I, I guess I'm that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, go to Cuba yeah, and you'll yeah. see why. You know, or, or the, the Dominican Spain, yeah. Republic or, or whatever. But um, you know, but so in France, they have a very unusual concept of basically when they say they don't see race, they try to mean it as literally as possible. I think. I'm going to get the details of this wrong, but to a first approximation, it's literally illegal to take statistics on race really? in France. The government does not do it. Hmm. The government. Wait, so wait, so for, France is I, like again, the conservative colorblind ideal of like, nope, we just move it past it. <laughs> Someone yeah, called Tucker the, Carlson. The, is... the idea of it is that all Frenchmen okay. are French. It's, it's and cultural. That's it. It's not ethnic. And it's like cultural. that's yeah. period. Yeah. It's, it's a cultural thing. If you're French, you're French. It doesn't matter if you're black French, you're white French, you're whatever. And so that that's one way to approach it. And again, I don't think this is literally true, but let's just say to a first approximation, they do not take statistics on race in France. Yeah. And that that leads to its own set of problems. You can see how in, in I, there's an idealized sense in which that could be a great way to approach the problem. But there are practical senses in which that, you know, the French society has not solved race. 
Um, so they, they have pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, in some they, respects. yeah, they still have racialized ghettos in France for I think they call them Benuelos or something like that. I'm going to mispronounce the word, Man, my, but where my immigrants live and it's up in arms with me you know, this time around. You know, there, there are still places where all the black Frenchmen live and all the immigrants live and they haven't solved the problem. So I, I wonder my question, Andrea, would be. Is that a preferable solution yeah. or like it is 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 there no great solution beyond just the messy process of history that we slowly get better at this stuff, hopefully? I feel like I won't comment on the fact that we're using like the great solution <laughs> as like language around all of this, but uh, uh, there there are things we could do. Uh, so I, I'm biased because I make a living with demographic data in companies. Like that's the kind of data science research that I do. And so if it was like, you know what's illegal? Race statistics. It was like, well, I'm out of work. You know, that's literally what I spend a lot of my time doing. I don't think that that's the answer. And my, ans my reasoning for that is that in the U.S., we do have protected categories that you cannot ask about. And so while we can ask about race and gender, and in some cases you have to if you're a company over a certain size with a, a couple of other things, I've helped companies run design and execute diversity in quotes surveys where we look for various things, but we try to go beyond just what does someone look like? We say, did your family struggle with money growing up? Are you facing student debt? What you And we wanted to put some things like chronic illness, mental health, disability status, and a lot of other questions to better understand what was going on and, and underscore that diversity at this company means 25 different mm -hmm. things as a starting point. And their legal team at this particular company was like, you cannot ask about a number of things. And two that really stood out to me were we cannot ask about religion and we cannot ask about disability or mental health type stuff. And that was over two questions, but they mm. kind of lumped it into one. HIPAA probably, right? To an, yeah, to an extent. Though if you're self-disclosing, it's like, it's something. But, but they were like, they're, they're protected categories. And so the risk is, is that if the company knows that you're Muslim or you're, you have depression or whatever then the company could be held accountable for discrimination and thus could get in trouble if they fire you because you can say, well, I told you I was Muslim and then mm. you fired me. And that really stood out to me. So we just deleted those questions and we didn't ask those things and we asked other stuff. But it, it, it is interesting because it means the company has no idea where they are on religious diversity or mental health diversity or whatever else. And so they can't address the issues or do anything to support maybe maybe everyone in the florida office has anxiety you could do something to help them whether that's the company's job is a whole other question right um you can't acknowledge religious holidays in a way of inclusivity all these other things and so the french example just sounds to me like that applied to the question of race and i think in the short term it certainly resolves a lot of ugly categorizing and counting and arguing but in the long term, it just means you're not doing anything I, about it, right? It's yeah. like almost the same argument that Trump gave when he was like, "Well, let's just not do I, more I'd like COVID to, tests." And we'll uh, to, COVID. to put in a um, to, to to split this though, I think we can make a, dis a distinction between diagnostics and prescriptions based on race. Diagnostics based on race can be very mm. helpful. Prescriptions based on race scare me. So a diagnostic based on race would be going. Um, we know that poverty is more much more correlated with the African-American experience than the white experience in the United States. Okay, that's that's a useful thing to know. And there might very well be mm -hmm. um, uh, systemic racism still in place. I will argue there is. Jeremiah, we can go on a tirade together about zoning laws and uh, about stuff in Los Angeles specifically. I know that we're, we're, we're on, on board about that. And we go, okay, that, that is something that's having that effect there. Once we get into the prescriptions, though, that that's where I, I go, okay, yay France, right? So um, if, if we're going to go, um, we are therefore going to give rights or privileges based on people uh, people's race in order to try and rectify this gap. That, to me, is frankly abhorrent. Uh, I don't mind changing the system. Um, a lot of the time we need to reform the system, but I want it to be universally applicable to everybody without awarding rights or privileges based on something beyond their control. And for that reason, I'm, I'm more concerned when we get into that kind of stuff with having government action more correlated with socioeconomic identity than with racial identity, because I'm, I'm more yeah. concerned with the people that are just impoverished and suffering, regardless of whether they're a white guy in a trailer park or they're a black guy in an inner city, than, than something that is phenotypical and, and not something they can control. Yeah. So let me, let me say two things about this. I, I think the first thing is that 
it's it's a lot easier for people who are on the political right to kind of take that stance because the political right does tend to operate more around what I would call ideological identities. This is as opposed to to race or gender or like identifier identities that I, I, I inherent okay. characteristics. And I don't think this is because they're necessarily better people. I think that in the current iteration of our politics, it's simply because you can't literally come out and say, I'm the white person who's advocating for white people and white people only, you know, and I, I'm, I'm I mean, the straight. You can, you can but it's going to marginalize <laughs> you. Even Donald Trump doesn't come out and say that, even though he winks at it in, mm -hmm. in 50 different directions. Even Trump will not literally come out and say, white people you know, f care about me. Um, so it, because it's, it's just taboo in a way that saying I'm trying to represent black people is, is not taboo. Tra saying I'm the representative for all white people is, is very much taboo. And you can make similar arguments for straight and man and things like that. So it's just, it's, it's more convenient for people on the right to make that argument because they already can't access that. So they'd prefer that nobody would be able to access that. Mm. And there, there's good reasons for that imbalance historically. You know, the, the history of the United States is by and large a history of white supremacy. And that, that phrase makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for the first 200 years of the American experience, we were a slave society. You know, we that racialized slavery. And then for, you know, another 100 years after that, we had institutionalized racism where Jim Crow laws and all that kept black people down, literally. And now for about 60 years past that, we haven't had formal legalized racism, but we've still had discrimination and, and a lot of things that lasted up into the present day and still kind of continue. And things have gradually gotten better over time, most people will tell you. But th I just want to point out, number one, there is a reason that people feel the need to say, like, I have to speak up for black people specifically. Mm -hmm. And you could do the same thing again for women that... For most most of history, it's been shittier to be a woman than to be a man. And there's reasons people feel like they have to speak up specifically for women in a way that it's kind of taboo mm -hmm. to speak up for men. So I, I don't know. That's I, I want to point out that while in the abstract, I agree that it, it's better to go off fundamental principles than it is to say, like, let's just help this one group of people. There are valid historical reasons why people have felt compelled to do that. Yeah, is is the only thing yeah, I, I want to point I think, out. I mean, there's there's I think you can certainly look and go, okay, um, there's multi generational impoverishment that's gone on with certain communities in the United States. African Americans were after slavery um, uh, discluded from getting mortgages and things like that, which meant that even after they've been quote unquote liberated, um, they were not getting the same. Uh, multi generational wealth accumulation that a lot of the rest of the that, that's all true, right? Um, that being said, I I uh, this may not be what you're saying, Jeremiah, but I want to be very clear on this. Like, what when I say that I want to treat everybody the same and have a, a, an equality of law in terms of rights and privileges, economic, judicial, or otherwise, it's not a smokescreen where I'm like, man, I can't come out and say I'm I'm white and I just want to help white people. How do I? Mm -hmm. And I I I'm willing to for the the conservatives that were invoked. I know quite a few of them that would feel the same way. And I think part of the rancor that we have right now in the country, which is weirdly a good thing, is that a six, a substantial amount of the American electorate truly does find racism abhorrent. And part of the problem is that we are actually disagreeing on the definition of racism. Uh, and a lot of this boils down to. Yes. Um, e equality, uh, e equality in terms of law or equality in terms of outcome. A lot of the time it's phrased, if you're going to economics, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. But for somebody like me, like um, you could take a policy and say, uh, even though this policy is race neutral, it is, uh, it is benefiting one race in its outcome. And I could go, okay, well, we can change that policy. But if you said we want to treat white people and black people differently in this policy, that immediately makes me go, well, that's racist, based on my definition. If I'm going to say that race is, uh, you know, rights and privileges according to skin color, um, so I, I don't think that it, it's necessarily a smokescreen, at least in my experience, at that of my conservative friends. So two quick things on that. First, to plug, and I think Heaton, I've mentioned this person to you before, a friend of mine from grad school. Her name is Ashley Jardina. She's a professor of political science at Duke. Uh, does research on white identity politics. And in particular, her research, and this was a rare thing when we were in graduate school, you would do racial identity and 
basically you studied every race except for white people. And, and a big reason for that, let me just be very clear, is that the default studies were all white. So it wasn't, there was no need to study white people because everyone the, was There's white almost a weird view that like white people don't have race. Well, sometimes. exactly. And so Ashley's work, I think, was very ahead of her time uh, and is now quite, uh, quite widely recognized and it's been written about in various places where she exactly is doing this, where she's documenting the rise of whiteness as an identity. And I think, Jeremiah, to your point that there are topics that are taboo and generally saying, like, my identity as a white person is not something that we do. We My might talk heart about rate went up when you said that. I was just Catholic. like, oh, man, yeah. I got to yeah. get the hood. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a sunburn from this light just talking about it. Uh, and uh, and ma- male and straight and all these things. And I think... I think they shouldn't be taboo because the experience of straight white men in this country is something that is a valid experience just like any other. And it is tough to be a straight white man in a lot of ways. And I think it's okay to talk about that. But even saying that, I'm like, don't put that clip out on its own. Okay, just just so you know. But but the second thing I want to say is that I think maybe uh, uh, to kind of stitch together some of what you both are saying, tell me if I'm missing this, is one way I think about the, I think, Heaton, your distinction on prescriptive versus descriptive is exactly the right one. And one thing I say to my consulting clients when they say, well, how do I get more black people in leadership, right? That's the dependent variable if you're a statistics person. So the dependent variable, the thing you're trying to explain or increase or understand, right, is more diversity, whether that's race or gender or religion or whatever else. And then the independent variables are the levers that might cause that to go up. And so often what happens is companies get fixated, which sounds like Joe Biden has gotten fixated and a lot of us have gotten fixated. And that's when we say identity politics is we're just trying to move the dependent variable without adjusting any of the structural, systematic, legal policy opportunities and all these other things that actually could Mm. drive that up. And a similar analogy, and I am not a nutritionist and I'm going to sound like I'm fat phobic, but a similar analogy is if you're trying to lose weight, don't focus on what's on the scale, focus on what you're eating and what you're exercising and what you're blah, 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 blah. Like, to me, that's the analogy. It's like you get hyper focused on like, uh, on like your the, what the scale is saying, or how many how many black people are on your on your board or your C suite, but you never pay attention to what's actually causing those numbers okay. to change. And that I think is the do the describing as a level of accountability, and then I say to companies like set those numbers aside and look at them again. And, and Andrew, can I give right? you an example of I think what you're talking about to make sure that I because that's that's a powerful yes. concept that you just outlined for us. So. Um, somebody like me who is inclined to have neutral policies in regard to identity, um, I, I think can be mistaken in terms of the outcome. Um, and what I mean by that is if if we had zero parental leave at a company, there's just no parental leave whatsoever. Mm-hmm. That is a, a gender neutral policy because there are no rights or privileges. Yes. So by my standards, that would not be sexist. However, somebody could rightly come in and say, while while being true, Heaton, disproportionately the pregnancies which happen at our company are held by women. So uh, there, mm-hmm. even though the policy is gender neutral, the outcome is not gender neutral, to, to which I would respond, okay, well, the, the gender neutral way of having this policy would be to have parental leave as opposed to maternal leave or something like that. But I, I can yep. see how, but the, the, the dependent variable would be the women are not advancing in the company because there is no maternity leave. Exactly. Uh, and then the, the heat and colorblind gender neutral solution would be, okay, everybody gets gets parental leave. That way we don't have to work yeah. rights or privileges based on gender. The, the other thing that pops it, Which a lot of companies yeah, which are I doing. Think, and is, I think is the helpful. equitable way to handle it. The, the other thing that pops into my head, Andrea, because uh, we're in the world of comedy, um, I don't know how many improv friends you have, but I, I, I being an amphibian, straddle the realms of both stand-up and improv. Mm. And I started oh, yeah. in improv, so well, I have you, a few you, UCB, on. Yeah, the yeah. Upright Citizens Brigade, would just flagellate itself constantly on how racist it was for the lack of mm-hmm. uh, people of color in the ranks. And I would come in and go, this is literally the most like neon woke environment I've ever been in in my entire life. And it was, I, I, I looked at it and I'm like, I think socio, it's probably socioeconomic and like, like all these things where I was looking at yeah. this going like, it's not... UCB costs them right, so It's not because you guys are racist. It's because pretending to be a beaver at a classroom at two o'clock on a Thursday is something that uh, white people that went to private schools tend to do. It's not something that somebody coming out of. I, I want to hear the continuation <laughs> of that story, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, so I, I've been monologuing for a minute. Jeremiah, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll let you get a, a worded edgewise about some of these distinctions. I mean, look, I... I 
I don't worry about this too much, honestly, because when I think about the grand questions of identity that I think are important in American politics, the fact that Joe Biden has made this explicit promise to nominate a, a black woman, I think it's kind of a, a little bit of a political own goal. But like, ultimately, I don't think it's a bad thing that it's happening. I, you know, there there are plenty of qualified black women and there's never been a black woman on the court. And, you know, sure, fine. I, to me, the Supreme Court is more of a thing where it's not really a question of nominating the best person. It's really like there's a bar you have to clear and there's probably 25, 35, 45 people who clear that bar. They have the requisite academic and and judge experience and, and pass the bar. You, anybody's going to be qualified. Mm -hmm. And so you can pick from among that pool. And it's, it's not like one of them is so much more legal than the other one that it, you know, that I, I don't know. To me, it's more, did you clear the bar to be qualified rather than there is a single best candidate? So, you know, with, with, with the people he's looking at, I think it's fine. I, I guess when I think about how identity works in American politics, I've kind of just moved on to the, the broader questions of the way that tribalism has taken over everything that's not just your race and your gender. You know, tribal politics go back as far as literal tribes of cavemen um, hitting each other in the head with clubs. It's it, as long as human history has existed, there's been tribalism. But the way that it's taken over everything these days is is an interesting thing where, you know, I, I talked earlier about like the emojis on Twitter, which is a little funny to talk about that there's an, a Yimby emoji. All the Yimbys put an avocado in their in their Twitter bios. Um, but but that's a real thing. And we have this increasing phenomenon where everyone has an identity based on what they believe rather than just their immutable characteristics. And this comes with every, you know, every form of tribalism. It means they have an in-group and an out-group. It means they have people they hate. It means they have sacred texts. Even if you're a neoliberal and your sacred text is Why Nations Fail by Darren Asimolu and, and James Robinson. You know, that's, awesome. you know, there's, there's literally awesome. like, you know, there's songs that people sing. You know, the, the rationalist community has literal songs. I, I remember there was um, Julia Galef, who I know you've had on your show. I, I'm a big Andrew. fan. I really like Julia. I wrote a, wrote, a book, wrote a book called The right. Scout Mindset. And she talked about how like breastfeeding mothers got into these giant culture wars with non-breastfeeders. Mm. You know, she talked about how Bayesian statistics mm -hmm. people had literal songs and chants that they would use against non-Bayesian statisticians. There were songs about Bayesianism. And tell me that like tribalism is not taking over everything when you when you hear examples like this it, it everything becomes an identity everything is tribal you've got your your in group your out group your symbols your iconography your holy texts Very much it's all, like this is what fascinates me that things like breastfeeding and bayesian statistics and yimbyism are now tribal and i I spend most of my time trying to figure out what that does. Hey, to back politics. at you. Yeah. So you, you have a few thoughts. <laughs> I, on tribalism, I, I happen to have written the rough draft of a book tentatively titled tribalism is dumb, uh, which I, I hope to find a reputable publisher <laughs> for. The, well, the world, the world is going to be dumb. Then, yeah. It's well, everywhere. It, it is. And, and it's no, it's a, it's a great point you bring up Jeremiah. And I, I almost wish um, just for, for, for people that had a similar reaction to the word identity politics that I did, if we just said, uh, Political tribalism, which is more or less the, the term that you're using mm -hmm. it in, it would have it would have it would have had a slightly different intonation at the beginning of the program. But I'm with you on this. I think it, we have become very tribal. Um, having put in a lot of thought on this, I don't think you can eradicate it. I, I think um, th this is my theory. I think tribalism is basically like horniness. That is to say, it's it's innate. Uh, it's not something that Andrew is. Is this a you problem or? <laughs> Let me rephrase. Is this Tri about tri Valentine's tribal Day again? What tribalism. We'll, we'll, we'll go back further. We'll go back to the bugs. <laughs> Tribalism's like hunger. That is okay. to say that it is it is a, a presupposed innate state um, that is not uh, in uh, it is not that it doesn't exist until invoked by an external presence. It is an internal presence that can be exacerbated by external stimuli. And I think tribalism works much the same way. That there are um, tribalisms there. Everybody has it. Um, it can definitely be exacerbated by things like politics and football games, but but there's some amount of it. The trick to me seems to have 
a Venn diagram approach to, approach to life. I think that that's the way to do it is almost to take like a Montaigne, like balancing against itself type of thing. If you have a, a unitary monoculture identity, you're going to be insufferable at cocktail parties. I don't want to hang out with you if you only have one identity because that's the only thing you're going to want to talk about. And the other problem is you're going to see the entire world very likely is a conflict with somebody else. Politics is the worst because politics is inherently Manichaean. Politics is predicated mm-hmm. on my tribe has to my tribe's animated by beating your tribe. Whereas like the Can I can I jump in here yeah. for a sec? Just to just to reinforce a point you made. Um Ezra Klein talks about this um in his book Why We're Polarized, that one of the reasons he thinks that America's become more polarized and a lot more our politics is more poisonous these days is that while we used to have overlapping identities that right. conflicted, you know, you would be a Southerner and right. a Democrat and a conservative and, a, Catholic. And, yeah. a, and a labor union, you know, and a Catholic and a labor union guy. And these would kind of pull you right. in different directions. You know, you're, you're a rural conservative guy, man that kind of predisposes you one way, but you're in a labor union and, you know, in your county, the labor unions have always gone Democratic. That pulls you another way um, that... That's what American politics used to be like, but increasingly everything is kind of brought up in this one universal right. culture war that increasingly there's not a, a, sing, the, a single issue as much as there is an all encompassing culture war that takes mm-hmm. everything. You know, the NRA is no longer really a gun rights organization as much as they are a generalized conservative body. Right. And, you know, the New York City pride, um, this is something I wrote about New York City pride is not an LGBT group anymore. They are a generalized progressive yeah. group. How do I know this? Because the Gay Officers Action League wanted to, the goal is a group of gay New York City policemen, and they right. were kicked out of Pride. They right. kicked a gay organization out of Pride because yeah. it conflicted with another part of the progressive yeah. identity. Right. And so this is Ezra's point is that now, rather than having these overlapping things where you're pulled in a lot of directions, it's yeah. kind of healthy. You have one overwhelming group of identities that all overlap on the left and one overwhelming group of identities that yeah. all overlap I, on the right. And so, that's much less healthy. So not to be uh, dismissive of Ezra Klein, but Ezra is building on an idea called party sorting, which comes from Morris Fiorina. And I think he, and every single we time we're on up, a podcast together, we no just, matter we what We need to invite is, him to like a joint birthday up. party or something because we always bring up Morris Maybe he Fiorina. can come yeah. to Marie's crisis I'll and eat him, some yeah. bugs. But that's the idea, right? Is that we used to have liberal Demo- liberal Republicans and yeah. conservative Democrats, and there was we all had more overlapping stuff, and so we had things that we could agree with each other on. And now those yeah, well, I, and I think that uh, Ezra Klein's point, which I agree with uh, Jeremiah, I think is kind of that on a on a macro level because it, it would it would seem to me yes. that. He did yeah. build on it. If, if you were to go back 30 years ago into certain parts of the United States right now, I mean, it's also worth noting that we all work in media uh, or we, we all work in politics, academia or media, which tend to be very sordid uh, areas where people mm. really think about this stuff, if not are living in an echo chamber. Um, if you go back, um, I don't know, 40 years uh, we're both at the Catholic Church. Yes, you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, but the thing that's probably more important to us is that we're Catholic. Or or it might well be that, yeah. you know, right after 9-11, we're both New Yorkers. I don't care that you voted for Giuliani and mm-hmm. I voted for, I assume, a Cuomo of some breed. Uh, but but uh, <laughs> but, but th- th- there are these different things, and those those overlapping identities that you bring up, Jeremiah, allow you to humanize people you disagree with because you know that you have commonalities yeah. with them. Um, but when it becomes yeah. a monoculture, you lack those things. And so you can you can other them and externalize them and make them cartoons. And, the, and there's him. there's numbers on this. Uh, not uh, just to say this very quickly, you can you can put data behind this that, you know, what what percentage of the time does a state that votes for a presidential candidate elect somebody different mm-hmm. to the Senate or a congressional district? How correlated is uh, Biden's performance in a congressional district with whoever the Democrat candidate is, that has gotten m- way higher over time. There's way less cross-party voting than right. there used to be, which is just a sign that kind of the culture war has encompassed everything. And now there's this very nationalized politics and regional politics are kind of dying in a sense. 
That said, there is some evidence to suggest that one of the reasons you don't see cross-party voting anymore, this is a counter-argument, I don't know if they're right, is that we see candidates who are more extreme because they think that they need to be more extreme in order to get the attention. And so it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're not going to cross over because the person who's on the right is so far to the right that even if the guy on the left is too far left for you, you're not going to go that far. So the polarization at the top makes it look like we're mm. barred. Anyway, uh, but I bring all of that up to say that, Jeremiah, you're, I'm so glad you said that about data. You can even show it without data, which is I know what everyone wants to hear about. But uh, one of my favorite papers of all time is uh, uh, a paper by Robert Axelrod, who was my dissertation advisor, called The Dissemination of Culture, a Model with Local Convergence and Global Polarization. And what he did was he just built a team, like a, a very, very small, simple computer model of agents, so people in a society, who had 10 different personality traits or political beliefs or attributes or whatever it is that you want, right? Uh, like abortion, guns, this, this, this. And everyone was given a number. And you basically just simulate and say, what if I only talk to people who have numbers within some range of my own numbers? And what if I let that go until forever? And basically what happens is if we only keep reinforcing and we stop having things in common with one another, you get into this locked in state. And the haunting conclusion is there's no way out without like really disrupting the system. So he would simulate it over and over and over and over again with all kinds of different perturbations at the beginning. And as long as we kept playing this tribalism game where the more I talked to someone, the more I became like them and the more, the more different I was from someone, the less likely I was to talk to them, you would end up in these like what we have now, which is basically yeah. a stalemate. So the, the chilling thing is I don't know what it looks like to get out. We've just jittered the whole I system like that, a I think boggle there's, board. I mean, it's a massive... <laughs> A, a, a massively large um, abstract problem to try and tackle, but I, I see two things that could help. One, one, I, I do think yeah. that um, I, I agree to the counterpoint you brought up earlier, Andrea, of uh, uh, parties going extreme. I, I, and I think that that's a structural mm. problem. I, I think that because we have closed primaries and first past the poll systems, um, uh, incumbents and candidates are always going to play to the extremists in their party, rather to the base, or rather to the moderates of their party, the non-aligned, or, or people in other parties. So that's going to always exacerbate polarization, and you're not going to be able to fix that unless you have electoral reform, a la ranked choice voting, and, and top five open primaries. That. Uh, Approval voting. Uh, so yeah, right. approval voting, <laughs> what, whatever, right? That's so the other I, thing I, we I always think talk that's, about. That's when a structural yeah. problem that that is going to keep happening with partisan politics until we we change the system. But the the other corollary to that culturally is much more difficult to do, uh, and because as as our good friend Morris Fiorina would point out, the the partisan sorting which has occurred has occurred uh, at the at the the level of politicians and media. It's not occurred all the way down. That is to say that most Americans, from a polling mm -hmm. perspective, are not actually more uh, polarized than they've ever been. It's just that they're better sorted, right? But I, I do think one of the problems culturally that is happening right now that, that I'm aware of, and I'm not entirely sure how to fix, is I think we are living in a very disconnected, alienating time. And people feel mm -hmm. adrift. They don't feel like they belong. They probably, like, demonstrably, this mm -hmm. is old Robert Putnam stuff, but it, it feels anecdotally true. And I think it's been backed up by uh, um, Carney and a few other people. That just the, the civic engagement in, man, I'm getting nerdy here, in intermediate civil institutions, which is to say things that are not government, yes. um, that, uh, you know, like church, Elks Lodge, Rotary Club, Gardening Club, Book Club, those numbers have declined over the last few years. And my, my suspicion mm -hmm. is that being innately tribal mammal animals, that is, we feel like we're not a part of a group, we crave that, and we're apt to latch on to whatever affords us right. that. And right now, the last man standing is politics, because politics can give you yep. purpose, direction, enemy, and coalition. And I find that very disturbing, because the more invested your ego is in that, the less intellectually nimble you're going to be, and the more of just a, mm -hmm. a kind of a... a uh, Galef uh, style uh, uh, warrior or gladiator as opposed to a middle scout or a problem solver. And also, again, how insufferable you will be at cocktail parties because you will view your holy right. duty as destroying the other team. Well, and that's exactly what Jeremiah was saying with the you know Bayesian versus frequentist statisticians at war with one another. If that's your identity, you're never going to actually do something useful or decide what which one is useful when and all those other things. But the other thing that's scary is, and I think also Jeremiah and Ezra were making this point, is that we have less and less in common when it comes to what media we consume and like popular. Like, I'm not a sports person, but I feel like sports are the last yeah. thing 
and maybe Game of Thrones <laughs> until it sucked, right? Were the last things that Americans had in common. Because you look at these studies and you say, well, what, what shows are people in this region watching? What shows are people who voted for Trump watching? And they're not the same show. Or we're not even consuming the same anything. It's not even that. Well, the, the I have bad news. It's, the only oh, other thing it, I'll say. Quick, it's just sports. It's yeah. not even like I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed so, Game of Thrones. But when you look at the numbers, like people were watching two and a half men way yeah. more than they were watching Game of Thrones. But yeah, Game of Thrones fair. people yeah, aren't see, watching that's two my own and a half men. Bubble. But sports, sports, that yes, please continue. Sports is one. Sports is one. And then the only thing I was going to say was just to underscore your point about belonging. And I'm so glad you brought that up because belonging is like tribalism before it goes bad. And it's exactly, it's, it's one of the deepest things that humans need is to feel that you belong, whether you're with a community or with your, so just, that's like, you know, and it's something that we crave. And I think you said craving and hunger and all those things. And so one thing I don't know is when does belonging end and tribalism begin? Is it when you don't have that overlappingness? Maybe that's it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and I turn this back to partisan politics where, look, I, I'm a Democrat and I operate in democratic circles. That's the that's the uh, the political calculation I've made is that I'm trying to make my mark on society through the organs of Whereas the Democratic I, I like Party being irrelevant. one way or another. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I'm an so I, I, I've chosen a side because I because I think it gives me the best chance to actually make change happen. You've got to pick a camp and try to work through them. I've chosen and a so, side because I'm lazy. So, <laughs> But so, you know, when, when I look at this and I think about what should Democrats be doing, I think that like Joe Biden needs to do as much red tribe signaling as he can. Because like, look, he... There's going to be enough blue tribe signaling with and, and he does a ton of it, even though he's kind of the most moderate of all the of all the Democrats who ran for president in in uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. He was the single most moderate. And that benefited him a lot because people didn't believe the attacks that Joe Biden is a radical socialist because they can see Joe Biden. They, like it, it, it doesn't. It, it, it also it helps. So, you know, when I think about like this, he actually likes America. Like when you listen to Joe Biden, you, you get yeah, the no, impression I, I, I was about to get to that. Here, yeah. Whereas a lot of Democrats talk about America like it's an <laughs> uncle they're stuck with. Like, they're like, of course, I wish I yeah. were born in Canada, but I'm here. So let's fucking make it work with all the bigots. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I, I love that. Like, I think we need Democrats who embrace a sort of liberal patriotism that like mm. it's I think it's really dangerous for America if patriotism becomes a, a thing exclusively on the right or if it becomes a thing where to be patriotic people accuse you of, of nationalism um th there's a the fine line between those two things sometimes but we need on in the democratic party more extremely patriotic rah-rah america politicians if, if we want to win frankly should we all put american flag emojis quick <laughs> next to our twitter handles is that step one Yes, absolutely. Okay, Although that is people, people are going to get mad at you because they assume when they see like an American flag emoji in your Twitter handle, they're going to make assumptions about you. That's that's how Twitter works these that days. That I was like, on at January sixth. You know, um, yeah. I will we'll, we'll have to wrap up here in a second. I, I just for, on a sheer political level, Jeremiah, I think you're very right about that. Where like I I find it. Um, being politically amphibious, having lived in New York, living in Austin, being from Oklahoma, having lots of friends who are progressives, having lots of friends that are conservative, um, I'm sort of amazed at uh, the inability to talk between the two groups a lot of the time. So like, um, like, like I, I think I've mentioned this on my podcast before. If not, I did it on somebody else's. But like, if, if I were selling solar panels to a Texan, I would not begin the conversation by going, you know how capitalism's ruining Mother Earth, who's being raped, uh, and we if, if only we could, but we could we could defeat <laughs> capitalism by by embracing the inner. I watched a Lena Dunham video about so like, and it's like, what are you doing? Like what I would do if I were I live in Texas, mm -hmm. if I were selling a solar panel to Texas, I'd be like, is your house off the grid? I'm self reliant. Are you self reliant? That's how I would do it. I would appeal to things that Texans like rather than going like, hey, yeah. guy, I hate. Quit, but you know, it's the same thing with with uh, you know, uh, on the other way around. Like, like you're not going to appeal to to progressives by by you know basically making a cartoon character of them and, and all of these things. And and uh, right. yes, it, it's weird how that is a, a moment in our political discourse. All right, I think I ran out of ground because I went uh, I, I I went too far. Should we go ahead and wrap up at this point? Any podcast conversation that ends with the word discourse is a That's success true. in my That's book. That's true. So. We got we covered a lot. We covered <laughs> eating bugs, which apparently I'm doing when I visit New York. Uh, Jeremiah, I, I I'll I'll okay. think, I, I got to make a plug for that. I'll make a note for that on my show to see how many how many bugs we can get me to eat uh, based on the political orphans rallying uh, for a good cause. And uh, it's yeah, a, you the, should the, do number the of charity. Bugs. 
The charity is Against Malaria Foundation, by the way. If anybody does want to donate, yeah, that's the uh, wait. That's the name of it's at. Against Malaria. Also, why aren't you eating mosquitoes? Doesn't that help good the point. cause? Yeah, <laughs> no. It, it, Andrea <laughs> brings up a good point. Anne had a way Messing better joke than I did. So good job, way. Andrea. We are going to go with that one. Uh, what? Also, Heaton, yours should be because so you did a threshold model, right, Jeremiah? You said if you get a hundred thousand, I'll eat some bugs. Yeah, Heaton, we could get interesting and do sort of, I don't know if you want to be linear or exponential, like a, you'll eat bugs in proportion to how much money you <laughs> Right, make. okay. I work, I leave you to the model, but I I, I think that's great. So like that. if it's a hot, hot... If you advocate, for, uh, you know, rank choice voting against first past the post, you've yeah, got to make or it. Or I could have like $100 per bug. And if I get 100,000, uh, that I have to eat 10,000 yeah. bugs, is that right? Which this just, that's what I'll do for the year. Uh <laughs> Math, math yeah, was never no, his strong Yeah, that's suit, right. We'll say. It's a very uh, good source of lean protein. <laughs> well, tell you what, I will. Uh, so. I'll I'll work this out and do do a do a plug for the All the right. charity thing on my show separately. But on that note, why don't we go around and say what our shows are? Uh, and uh, uh, Jeremiah, I think we have some crossover between our two audiences, so I'll I'll plug some stuff I think your audience would like, and vice versa. So, uh, Andrea, your show. Sure, I'll plug some stuff no one's gonna like. Uh, I. Uh, run a podcast called Majoring in Everything. It's about people who are sick and tired of being told to focus on one thing and are multi-talented generalists who do lots of awesome stuff. So Heaton was was kind enough to be my guest a few weeks ago. I love ago. talking about myself. About and Andrea said I got to do comedy, that. Comedy, yeah, politics. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so so that's a lot of fun. And I also especially wish to plug uh, my my premiere of my one-person show on March 1st at Caveat in New York City and streaming online at caveat.nyc. It is called The Data Science Spectacular. And it is, I am claiming, I am claiming, I, I want someone to refute this, it is the best one-person comedy and circus-accented show about data science in the You know world. what, now that... All right, and so you can come... Ruth Bader Ginsburg's died, yeah. I think that's true. Uh, she she had the I best think, one, I think I can now, do it, yeah. right, so... If you are, have been wondering what data science is about and have been too afraid to ask and or anticipatorily bored by the answer, you can come to this show, caveat.nyc, and it's uh, in person and online March 1st. And I'm on Twitter and all the other things at Jonesroy, J-O-N-E-S-R-O-O-Y, and you should come to my show. I'm, I'm putting it in my calendar. I won't, be, I, won't, I won't still be up there unless I'm still eating bugs. I will be back in Texas by that time, but okay. I will watch yeah. it online. <laughs> Donate so he yeah. needs enough bugs to stay and come to my show. Yeah. I, I never thought I would hear the phrase data science through the lens of interpretive Cirque du Soleil style mm -hmm. stunts. But apparently that exists and, and I'm uh, here for it. Yeah, well, it will exist as of Jeremiah, I'll make a little bit of a plug to uh, about you for my audience. So I host the Political Orphanage. Hence, there's quite a lot of miscreants, quite a lot of people that have not signed up for one of the two major parties. So noting that, that, that Jeremiah has outed himself as a Democrat, I, I believe Jeremiah and I stand lockstep on zoning tirades. I think with, like if you've ever heard me talk about <laughs> Euclidean zoning ordinances and, and minimum lot sizes, it comes up with a lot of stuff. Uh, I believe Jeremiah is doing God's work on that. Uh, he's doing the Lord's work, as are the neoliberals over there. Uh, and I, I find that you all tend to be, the, the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party tends to be the more of the regulatory hawk side of the party that I hope gains preeminence within that coalition. So uh, yeah, Jeremiah, the, the neoliberal podcast, any shows you've done recently you want to you wanna, uh, mention? Sure. I mean, so we we do a lot of stuff. We do deep dives on particular areas of policy or just political issues that are that are coming up. We've done one recently on the big tech antitrust bills that that are making their way potentially through Congress and and whether or not they make any sense. We've you know talked about inflation, an episode on what's going on with inflation. We've got episodes on you know crypto and what really is going to be the value out of cryptocurrency, if anything. So we've got a bunch of stuff like that. And if you're interested in that kind of deep dive political policy stuff, come check nice. us out. And uh, I, I am Andrew Heaton, the host of The Political Orphanage. I'll make a pitch to your neoliberals, Jeremiah. Uh, so for the neoliberals already having established my bona fides as a zoning hawk, uh, I would like to bring up that I just did a, a two-part special on homelessness on the political orphanage, which did a lot of policy analysis. The uh, The first episode was very policy-heavy. I think that you all would particularly like it as the neoliberals who compelled Jeremiah to eat bugs 
because you are clearly policy-oriented people who also have an altruistic bent to you, and that episode is certainly that. So come check out The Political Orphanage. And uh, uh, I'll say this to the political orphans for whom I speak on behalf of, we're totally an open relationship type organization. You can be a Democrat, you can be a Republican, you can be a Libertarian, come hang out. They are very welcoming. As, a, as an out Democrat myself, I find uh, that, that the political orphanage crowd uh, accepts yeah. me for who I am, and yeah. I appreciate that. All right. Well, hey. It was- Plus, your homelessness episode trended hard on Venmo. So uh, someone Venmoed you to say, "Oh, great episode," and I creepily commented on it. And so if you're not if you're trending on Venmo, you know it's a so good what, episode. If, you know what? If I had great to pick a platform to do well on, Venmo's the one that I would actually prefer. I'd rather do that than Snapchat. It actually, is- uh, well, gang, it has been a pleasure <laughs> talking to you both, uh, Andrea. It's good to see you, Jeremiah. Good to see you. Thank you so much. And that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Majoring in Everything. I'm your host, Andrea Jones Roy. And Majoring in Everything is a proud member of the World's Smartest Podcast Network. Be sure to check out worldsmartestpodcastnetwork.com and our partner shows. We are edited by Eric P. Stipe, who says that I need an outro, so I'm making one. Eric, does this count? Are you happy? I hope so. Thanks again for listening. Keep majoring in everything. Bye.